Hello everyone, welcome to version 1.2 of my Resident Evil Village, Village of Shadows difficulty. No damage, no extra content items, no infinite ammo walkthrough. This is going to be the full game, just like what I did previously with my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, before it eventually became a Resident Evil Village disappointment video, which I got lost in the moment, and eventually when I was in the middle of editing and I realized this was happening, I thought, hey, this will be the, the video actually, rather than talking a lot about what I'm doing in my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, given that version 1.2 was very similar to version 1.1, minus some minor changes to certain areas of Resident Evil 7. But that was a very fun video to do, and now I'm back here, and I promised I would do another version of this walkthrough again, which I'm doing right now. And compared to my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, uh, the strategies that I utilize for this game on this version are very different to version 1.2. Like with this section right here, this first lichen that I'm about to deal with, I'm going to use the counter method, which, if you've seen my killing a lichen using the false counter video that this game has, you understand what I'm talking about. And the reason why I call it a false counter is because the amount of times I got moments where the counter just wouldn't work, and I assume it's because of the fact that new Capcom didn't playtest the mechanic very well. It, it almost felt like a mechanic that was originally going to be in an earlier version of the game, and it had a lot of thought to it. But then at some point it just felt like it was scrapped, and they just forgot to remove it, which is why the mechanic is very inconsistent. Uh, but it turns out, it's not as inconsistent as I thought, and the only reason it comes across as inconsistent is because this mechanic that you're seeing right now, it only works in certain environments, particularly in flat environments, but even when there are moments when the environment is entirely flat, the mechanic just sometimes doesn't work. You've got to understand where this mechanic works if you want to understand how to deal with certain lichens during this moment. Like, right here, this is a good spot to stand. And how this mechanic works is when you hit the lichen at the correct point in its attack animation, uh, before its active frame period actually begins, you will actually do a stun against the lichen, and then he will retaliate, and he will try to grab you. But if you press L1 during this animation right here, you will kick the lichen away. And if you try to knife him while he's in that stumble animation, he will cancel his animation and he'll jump backwards. Um, if you've seen my re most recent video, where I managed to do the entire village fight using no barriers and without using any kind of extra content items, you will understand that when I did the counter, the other lichens were not trying to attack me, and I was also not attacking the lichen when he was in the stumble animation to buy myself some more time so that I could end the sequence quicker. So, using that method, I was able to deal with that whole entire sequence, and for what you just saw, it was very helpful against that first lichen. So I was able to kill that lichen knife only. And in version 1.0 and 1.1, I already found uh, another knife only method to deal with that first lichen where you just gotta bloop his grab and then strafe away, and then you gotta make sure you're minding your surroundings as you're doing that method, and you just gotta stay on the bottom level. Which, it was also a reliable method, but there were moments where uh, it could screw up, because the Lycan's behavior is very sporadic in this game. And going back to what I mentioned before about the Lycans in my earlier videos of Resident Evil Village, the Lycans are probably the worst enemy in the game by far. But after seeing this counter, it makes me wonder what this enemy could be like if it, w it actually embraced Resident Evil 4 mentalities, if it was as good as the Ganados of the Maginis from Resident Evil 5. Like, if this enemy actually took consistent hit stun, and it had a reasonable amount of life to balance out the fact that it's a very fast enemy, and there are so many of them at once, this could have been a really fun sequence, but this village intro has to be the worst introduction ever to a Resident Evil game, because if you try doing it normally, there are just so many moments where the Lycans can just get a lot of forward momentum on their attacks, they can cheese you with their shitty hitboxes, and when specifically referring to the former case, the amount of times I put the Lycans off camera and they skip the whole animation where they have to pull out their weapon and then they just immediately do that bullshit weapon attack of theirs that affords them so much for a momentum and you can crouch under it, yet there are attacks that look very similar to that. Like, for instance, with the Mariekas when they do their vertical attack, that you can actually crouch under, yet you can't do it with the Lycans, and there are similar attacks like that in Resident Evil 7 that you can crouch under and avoid. So there's no excuse for why it works the way it does. And then the Lycans have the ability to spam grab like crazy. They spam their running grab like crazy on Village of Shadows difficulty. 
and the running grab is very bullshit because the only way to avoid it is to strafe away. But if you actually shoot the Lycan in a spot where the counter works at the correct moment before he actually starts his whole startup animation for the grab, you can actually stop that attack. But it's still not reliable on the slightest. Like, there's just so much wrong with the Lycans on this game, and I need to point it out when I do my review, which I'm going to start after the DLC releases, which I know for sure is going to be a very shit DLC. Like, New Capcom just exerted little to no care with this game at all when designing the enemies, when designing the sections, when just designing the scenarios that they put you in. Which is why for this part of the village intro right here, you see me utilize this barricade method, and I'm going to glitch out one of the lichens so that they're just stuck on the side of the barricade, and they're trying to do the whole animation and breaking down the barricade, but it's not actually registering. That being said though, there is a rare moment where, even when they're at the side, uh, the barricade can still take damage, so you gotta bear that in mind, and just get them off the barricade as soon as possible. And, you know, just relying upon this, it just looks so stupid. And this is the only reliable method that works consistently. And th it doesn't help that this sequence is time-based and not kill-based. And the fact that it's time-based just forces you to rely upon this kind of method. And the way the Lycans behave during the sequence, there are just so many moments where they just don't follow you, and they just sit back and do nothing. And it just makes no sense for them to behave that way at all. And it's, it just feels like a very buggy AI system. And because there's so many Lycans, their AI just clashes with each other, and that's why there's just so many moments where they exhibit very irrational behavior that just feels like it wasn't played tested correctly. Just like what you get with Bella, for instance, when she just runs into a wall for no reason, or she doesn't attack you, or when she doesn't try to do so because the Morieikas are trying to attack, or when you use a mine on a Morieika, it doesn't stun Bella if it's indirect, which is bullshit, and Aether has footage of this happening. Like, there's just a lack of care and a lack of thought in how the developers put together all the designs, and it's almost like they don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand the fundamental designs that they put into this game. Like, with the amount of problems that Ether and I have shown with Bella's boss fight, for instance, and just the amount of broken designs put in place with Bella and the Moriakas, what the fuck were they thinking? There's, there is no way anyone plays this to that, and they thought it was suitable for Village of Shadows difficulty. There is no fucking way. It, it just makes no sense at all. And it's just stuff like that that really makes me not take this game seriously. I mean, I, I still take this game more seriously than Resident Evil 2 Remake because that game I can't take seriously at all because it's just a very lazy excuse for a Resident Evil game. It doesn't even feel like a game most of the time. It just feels like a horror simulator with how much you're running past the enemies. And running past them is so effective because there's barely any designs put in place that really benefits the complexity that Resident Evil 7 and the previous Resident Evil games had. And just the, the lack of seriousness involved with the characters, and just the dialogue moments, and just the scenarios that they put you in, it just feels so laughable in Resident Evil 2 Remake, but not so much in this game, but even still though, there are just those designs in Resident Evil Village that just really makes me not take new Capcom seriously at all. And if you need to get a better idea as to a lot of the broken designs for Resident Evil Village, check out my poor designs of Resident Evil Village Part 1. I'm still planning on doing a part 2 for this series, and maybe even a part 3, because there's a lot to talk about with this game, and a lot of poor designs to really show. And there's a lot to really say about people when it comes to their reactions to that video. Like, I remember some idiot posted a comment on that video, and he's like, or maybe the game just doesn't handle you as much compared to the other Resident Evil games. Like, can you be that fucking dense? How can you say that that video is all about me whining and not showing the poor designs put in place? Do you really think a broken game is serviceable? Do you think bad hitboxes and moments where enemies can hit you through the geometry? Or moments where their AI just turns off? Or moments where the mechanics just betray you? Like, you think that has anything to do with hand-holding? Do you honestly believe that I'm whining about that? Do you honestly think it's my fault for putting myself in that situation? Do you honestly think that what you're seeing in that video is a fake? Do you honestly believe that that is a proper excuse for a functional game and you want to attribute it to hand-holding because you want to somehow like nullify the bad effects generated by that video if you're such a fanboy for this game? Like, that has to be one of the most retarded comments I have ever heard, and I have no idea who that guy is, but I hope to God that the next time he shows himself, I'm just gonna block him. Because he has to be one of the most retarded individuals on the planet if he thinks that what I showcased in my poor designs of Resident Evil Village Part 1 is the result of the game not hand-holding me as much. 
Are you even human when you make that kind of statement? Do you honestly believe that what I demonstrated there was anything to do with hand-holding? There is nothing about hand-holding when it comes to objective flaws with your fucking game. How can you say that? How can you possibly say that this is okay for this game to be in the state that it is? That it's somehow beneficial to the supposed challenge that this game presents? This game isn't a real challenge. This game is just nothing but poor designs. There's rarely a moment in Resident Evil Village when I can actually consider a scenario properly designed and actually challenging for all the right reasons. Like, a great example of this is Heisenberg's boss fight. Heisenberg's boss fight is the best part of this game because it's the only part of the game that actually comes to mind when it comes to good designs, when it comes to designs that developers took seriously, designs that actually feel accommodating for a functional game, designs that aren't built upon shaky foundations. That is a fight that rewards skill and a lot of intelligence when it comes to understanding how Heisenberg works. And there aren't any bullshit designs, and the RPG designs that this game favors do not impact the flow of that fight at all. That right there is the best part of the game. By far, Heisenberg's area is a very fun area, and his boss fight is done so perfectly, and that's why he's the best boss of this game. And... I am someone who at least has the right to make such statements because I am probably one of the few people on the planet who actually looks at the objective designs in the game, whereas people like Under the Mayo or Sphere Hunter, just they don't look at these kind of subtle designs with their with the games or with any of these kind of mechanical flaws that just diminish the game's quality. They they don't look at that at all. They instead focus on all the stupid stuff like oh the aesthetic of the game, oh the lack of puzzles, oh the the, the all these other things that have to do with the enemy's appearances, this and that, or like with the way scenarios play out. Like, d does that really matter? Does that really matter when it comes to a fucking game? You're talking more about a movie in that case rather than a game. What the fuck are you people talking about? Why are you trying to give po pointless designs like that any kind of importance as if they somehow impact the flow of the gameplay? Just shut the fuck up and just try, try to do better with your fucking reviews of a game. Like, when I do my review, I guarantee you, it'll probably be the best review of Resident Evil Village. It'll be the most objective review. It will actually critique actual flaws in the game compared to what you'd be getting with IGN or GameSpot or with Under the Mayo or with Sphere Hunter. It's just unbelievable that people are so dense and so ignorant as to consider this game a masterpiece. This game is no masterpiece. It's a fun game, and it has its charms, but objectively, it is not a perfect game at all. It is a very flawed game that just really reeks of disrespect on New Capcom's part. And speaking of disrespect, we're making our way over to Bella's boss fight, and this is really where the game sets its tone improperly, because Bella being the first boss of this game, when they design a first boss as shit as her, it really sets the stage for what exactly Resident Evil Village is like when it comes to its mechanical designs, and it really shows in some of the later areas that you come across. But Bella and Moreau are the worst parts of Resident Evil Village by far. But make sure you take this path like this, and then you gotta be very quick here, otherwise that Morieka will hit you. And then there are times when the Morieka will sometimes uh, get in front of you, whenever you exit from that uh, cage area. And then this guy here can choose to strafe, but then other times he just chooses to grab you, so you gotta be prepared to block. That flaming Morieka just spawned right there, which is, yet again, another great example of very poor enemy placement, and the fact that new Capcom are so dense and just so oblivious to that kind of problem, with the amount of times you get spawn trapped by that enemy right there. And you just gotta equip your mine right here, and you gotta place it right here. Uh, equip your pipe bomb, and then press X, but do not skip the cutscene. You gotta make sure that Ethan hits the ground before you skip this cutscene to ensure that Bella will attack you. I don't know why the cutscenes, whenever you skip them, they impact the gameplay sometimes, and that's why you gotta wait a little bit before you skip a cutscene, but do what I did just then, where you throw a pipe bomb and then use your shotgun to smash that window to stun Bella for a bit, and then just hang back. She's doing her jumping attack right now, so you gotta make sure you hug the right hand side and then immediately loop back to the left to avoid that, and then make sure you quick turn so that you understand what she's doing. She is very fast sometimes when it comes to running at you the moment she does one of her long-range attacks or her jump attack. So, if you get into any moments where she is running at you, you've got to be sprint away very quickly. That being said though, the movement problems on this game can get you screwed so many times. The turning animation is more priority than the sprint animation. The, the delay on your movement whenever you just stop sprinting immediately and you're just unable to sprint for a few seconds after that, it is not beneficial in the slightest. It just gives Bella a free pass, and her hitboxes are so fucking awful. Bella probably has the worst hitboxes I've ever seen out of every boss in the entire Resident Evil series. And just reflecting back on Bella, 
And thinking of Resident Evil Zero's bosses with the infected bat, the infected bat is hated by so many because you fight the auto aim all the time. You don't fight the boss, you fight the auto aim because of the smaller bats, and they prevent you from actually prioritizing the bigger bat, and that's how the bigger bat gets a free hit on you, and then you have to struggle with the smaller bats just hitting you all the time. Like, that sounds like a really bad fight, but in all honesty, guys, I'd honestly consider Bella to be worse than that. I think Bella is worse than the infected bat from Resident Evil Zero, because the hitboxes put in place with Bella are fucking awful, and just a lot of the designs put in place with her. Why does she have to do these multi-hitting attacks that almost give the impression that you can crouch under them when you actually can't? I mean, you can't- you can crouch under the, the first, second, and fourth hit, but not that third hit. So, if you can't crouch under the third hit, what is the whole point of staying near her, and when her hitboxes are gonna be oh look at this right here that was that right there was very bad that right there is a great example of Bella being very inconsistent because she decided to get in very close to me before doing her long range attack and the fact that she can do her long range attack at close range you have to get so lucky with those kind of moments at times but as I was saying why does she have to do this kind of multi hitting attack when their hitbox is already so shit are they really expecting you to just strafe away from that and then Bella for whatever reason is just so brain dead that she just decides to smack thin air as if she's somehow going to get a hit up when I'm just like five feet away from her. Like, when you consider that, and the shitty hitboxes in place, and a lot of the other bad designs put in place with Bella, there's no thought put together with how Bella works in this whole entire fight. And at least with the infected bat from Resident Evil Zero, if you saved your flame rounds and you timed your shots correctly to actually stunlock the infected bat, five flame rounds were enough to kill that boss. So, at least it went down very fast, but Bella doesn't go down very fast on Villager Shadow's difficulty. On Hardcore difficulty and on the earlier difficulty, she goes down way faster than that. So much so that two mines, a pipe bomb, and a couple of shotgun shells are enough to kill her. But you try doing that in Villager Shadow's difficulty, and she doesn't die at all. Why they had to give her so much life, and why they had to pair her with Moriekas that just affect her AI and cause her to do very weird things, and it doesn't even benefit her personality whatsoever. I mean, Bella, Cassandra, and Daniela feel like the type of individual who just try to hunt their prey by themselves because they want the glory of the kill to themselves. Why would they share it with Moriekas? And furthermore, why put Moriekas for that encounter, yet not for Bella, oh, I'm sorry, not for uh, Daniela and Cassandra, or even for like the other bosses, I mean with the Lycans in Urias' boss fight, I can understand them being put there, because you at least have the ability to stop Urias from spawning them in, and even when they do spawn in, the Lycans have very little health, but the Moriekas in Bella's boss fight have the same amount of health as their normal counterparts when you're just encountering them throughout Castle Dumithresk and the rest of the areas. Why don't they have reduced health? Why is it that they don't die after one mine? If they died after one mine, that would make so much sense. And another problem with the Moriekas is that they don't flinch. They don't flinch from the shotgun whatsoever. They take two shotgun shells before they eventually get knocked down. And even then, they're still alive. They take so many shots from the shotgun to go down. And the fact that they barely flinch, and the shotgun fires so slowly in this game, by the time you fired your first shot, and you're preparing to fire your next shot, you would have already been hit! And Bella gets so much range on her attacks because of the phantom range present with her, and the amount of range she gets on her grab, and you can't even crouch under the grab because the hitbox is so poorly programmed. It's just so unfair, and so poorly implemented, and it's just another great example of treating you Capcom like it's a joke. It's like they want us to view Resident Evil Village as a joke in the Resident Evil series. It's just so insulting. Were they drunk or were they high when designing that boss fight? Because that has to be the case. There is no way a whole team at New Capcom designed that fight. Like, a 900 members or whatever. I don't even know how many members there are in New Capcom. But there is no way, like, hundreds of people looking at that fight thought that was acceptable. There, there is no fucking way. Like, what, not one person looked at it and they thought it was suitable? And the QA testers were perfectly okay with that? Are you fucking serious? Like, I've never been so insulted by a boss, and I never thought a developer could be that dense, almost as dense as a fan trying to design a fan-based game. And we all know the state of fan-based games, and fan-based games do not have the same level of quality as a AAA game. But that right there is not AAA in its quality. That right there, it just feels like a two-year-old designed that whole entire encounter. And why is it that after so many Resident Evil games, they could be making this kind of mistake with the bosses? Did they not look back at the previous Resident Evil games and actually wonder how well their bosses were? Yet, they decided to favor this kind of shit model because they probably looked at Resident Evil Zero for a reference. Like, Resident Evil Zero has some pretty shit bosses, and so do the side games. Like, there are certain side games in the Resident Evil series that have some pretty shit boss designs. And this is a mainline Resident Evil title! 
when you go to a mainline Resident Evil title, you expect the best quality. Obviously, with side games, that there, there's going to be diminished quality there. But Bella's boss fight just feels like a boss design that should have been in a side game. And I shouldn't even be saying that. It's a design that shouldn't be the case at all in any game. That should be a design that a developer looks at and says, that doesn't fucking work. Let's, let's scrap that and actually redesign that whole entire encounter. But they just rushed through this game because they exerted little to no care with this game at all. And yes, there was a pandemic, but at the same time, even when there's a pandemic, you should have delayed the fucking game. There are so many designs on this game that just do not feel right, that feel equally as bad as Bella's boss fight. And it's indicative of a game that was rushed, and it should have been delayed. Do you know the amount of games that released during the pandemic that had a delayed re release date? Hey, look at The Last of Us Part 2. Last of Us Part 2 released in a delayed state, but that game actually has better qualities than this game. This game is a poor sequel compared to The Last of Us Part 2. Last of Us Part 2 has a really good story. It has some really great designs with its mechanics. But this game, the story on this game is just poorly handled, and the mechanics of this game are not properly handled at all. There is just a level of mishandling involved with the way this game is on Village of Shadows difficulty. And the hardest difficulty, as I mentioned for the thousandth time, it is there to actually showcase the developer's true mindset, to showcase what they actually value, to showcase the level of work they actually put into this game. So a new Capcom is saying they put a lot of hard work into Resident Evil Village, and you're seeing a lot of those kind of scenarios that just somehow made their way into this game. Is that really indicative of hard work? There is no fucking way that is indicative of hard work. And look at this right here. This is an encounter that, on my blind playthrough, it was actually intimidating, and the music here really complements that intimidation factor. Lady Dumbitress is actually making yourself known when she's chasing you, and it really makes the tone feel menacing in this case, but then when you put in two more Yekas on Village of Shadows difficulty, just arbitrarily, and they don't exactly provide that much of a challenge, it, like, why are you trying to draw the player's attention away from Dumbitress as the center point of fear? Like, why are you doing that? Why are you showing that level of disrespect to Dumbitress in that scene? That just makes no sense at all. It is so insulting to Lady Dummy Trust, because I do like her as a villain. And I do like that sequence, because I, I love the intimidation involved with that. That's definitely one of the few moments where this game can really embrace the intimidation factor that is beneficial for survival horror games. But they just threw all that away when they decided to put those two Moriegas in. You don't see any kind of molded whatsoever just roaming the house in Jack's area whenever you're trying to escape from the main house. Jack is given the center point of attention whenever he's roaming the house. And you didn't even have to deal with him because you could just use three antique coins to actually get the key that allows you to b get to the next area. So you sacrifice currency that allows you to gain access to like, weaponry from cages in the later areas in order to get a key, which is a really cool design right there. And as I discussed before in Resident Evil 7, Mano's difficulty is just handled so much better than Village of Shadows difficulty on this game. Mano's difficulty had a level of seriousness involved with every single design put in place. There was a lot of meticulous designs put in place that really benefited Mano's difficulty as being a unique difficulty modifier and not just some arbitrary, oh, let's just increase the enemy HP, let's put so many enemies in single rooms that it's almost like we fell asleep at the keyboard, and let's design scenarios that aren't be beneficial for a functional game. There is no kind of lack of seriousness involved with Mano's difficulty, but with this game and with Village of Shadows difficulty, the level of seriousness involved is so little with this game. I mean, look at this upcoming boss fight right here. We're about to en encounter Daniela, and Daniela's not even a fight, but it's definitely like the better daughter fight because if the daughters are going to be so shit in their designs, why not just give the player this kind of ability to just spam this switch like crazy so that she can't do anything and just make her run away? That actually feels complimentary to the fact that they programmed the dollars so poorly on this game with their shitty hitboxes and their bullshit attacks. Like, this right here is probably how the dollars should have been. They should have just been non-fights, just like with the Tyrant from Resident Evil 1 Remake, because in order to compliment knife only, they had to make the Tyrant do absolutely nothing, which is why he's the best boss on that game, which is such paradoxical thinking. And this right here is paradoxical thinking that's needed because of how poorly programmed the, the dollars are in this game. And I think it's safe to say, guys, I don't like the castle anymore. I used to like the castle, but now that I think about it, it just isn't that good of an area anymore. Like, the way the Moriegas are placed, the way that the Samkas are such a forgettable enemy, the way the daughters are just so, so poorly programmed, and they just set the tone incorrectly for Resident Evil Village. 
and just with the level design just getting kind of old when you're just dealing with so many bad enemy placements. Like, it's just, it's so poorly done, and the only good part of the Castle Demetrius is Lady Demetrius boss fight, which to this day I still love. And I just love the fact that it just really allows Ethan Winters to stand out when he's dealing with this kind of boss, his second time fighting BOWs, yet every other Resident Evil character, their first and second time fighting BOWs, has never encountered anything so extreme compared to Ethan Winters, his first time and second time fighting BOWs. Like, it's just so exciting going through Dimitrescu's boss fight, and she works perfectly. I mean, she's simple, yes, but she's simple in a way that complements the designs put in place with this game, because this game embraces some very, very simple designs, and not really to the same degree as Resident Evil 7. Like, Domitresque has to be simple, but at least the, with the way she's presented, she's intriguing. And just the level of excitement involved, with how much she's just wanting to come after Ethan, and then with the music that plays, and then with the way she looks, she looks amazing when she's in her beast form. I gotta give credit to the game, the the way the enemies look in this game, they look really nice, and Domitress looks so, so amazing when she's in her beast form, I absolutely love it. And, you know, all those parts of Domitress boss fight I really love, and then when I just hear that line, you've got nowhere else to go, Ethan, like just the fact that she calls out Ethan's name, the fact that an aristocrat is giving a commoner like Ethan, like someone who is a seemingly normal individual who doesn't really get a lot of attention, the fact that she's at least taking the time to acknowledge his name, yet she's an aristocrat, she has no reason to acknowledge someone of a lower class than her, that really goes to show why you shouldn't underestimate Ethan Winters or any normal individual when they put their mind in the correct direction and they actually put aside all kinds of emotions that just get in the way of proper functioning. Like, he is such an amazing individual, and when he's receiving that much attention from an aristocrat like Lady Domitresk, like, just the amount of, like, attention he was getting in those trailers, and then just seeing him getting the attention from an aristocrat in those initial trailers for Resident Evil Village, that was just so exciting, just to see Ethan Winters just get that level of attention. And then having that be portrayed in Lady Dummytress's boss fight was just truly amazing, and it's just such a blast to go through Lady Dummytress's boss fight, and just, you know, seeing, like, lower class and higher class just coming together in that boss fight was just truly a great experience. But like I said, that's really the only enjoyable part of the Castle Dumitresk I actually like. And now we have the Samkas, and don't even bother wasting time with this enemy. It's such a forgettable enemy. You only encounter it in one sequence, which is here, and then you never see it again because it's only reserved for side areas, and you'll never have the chance to go to the side areas, because if you want to get through Villager Shadow's difficulty in an optimized fashion, you'll want to go to those side areas when it's actually right, at the right moment in the game. So this right here is a very forgettable enemy, it is not even an enemy worth fighting, it is very evasive, it has a lot of life, and it can be pretty, pretty annoying, and there's so many of them, it's just not practical in the slightest. Uh, this right here, there are times when the Samkas can get in front of you, I don't know how their pathing works when they're trying to navigate the environment, but I don't know why there are times when they just stack up at the zip line. so it can be very tricky to get past these enemies sometimes. But I always put in two shotgun shells for the sequence, just in case uh, one of the Samkas gets close, so I just shoot them away with the shotgun. It's nice that the shotgun's a guaranteed stun on them, but again, it's just an enemy type that is more of an obstacle than an actual enemy type, so it's just very forgettable in that state. But now that that sequence done, we're just about to make our way over to Cassandra, and Cassandra is a fight I do like, because the room actually feels befitting for hitboxes compared to uh, Bella. But even still, though, the fact that they haven't even fixed the hitbox issues present with these daughters is just irredeemable. In fact, one thing that I'm really disappointed with with the daughters is that they're all just similar with each other. There's no real difference between them. I just wish that each of the daughters had their own specific fighting style or some kind of unique weapon that's specific to them. I don't like how they just use the exact same weapon and they have the exact same moveset and the same exact broken hitboxes. It doesn't make them very unique from each other. That's just something that I kind of wish the game had, but it just sadly settled for less. Like, can you imagine the kind of weapons that these enemies could wield? Like, why not just have, like, a sword or some kind of a scythe, for instance? Or, like, so something like that. Like, something to really make them feel different from each other. They could have, like, one-handed and two-handed weapons. Like, you know, something to make their fight very memorable in that sense, but instead, it's just the same fight, but the room's different. So, you're not really getting anything really special with each of these fights. Instead, what we get is a very shit fight with Bella, 
a very uh, simple fight with Daniela, and a semi-decent fight with Cassandra. And stay near the corners of this room if you want to avoid her hitboxes. Uh, if you aren't aware, there is a pattern to how the daughters attack you. So after they do the big grab that you gotta run away from, they always try to retaliate with two of the combo attacks. And if you're far away after the second combo attack, they always do the long range attack. And she just did it then, where she fl flailed about, then she just ran towards you. There are two long range attacks. There's one where Bella does a jump attack, and then the other one that is something that all the dollars can do. I, I don't think Daniela can do it, however. Um, it's the one where they flail around and they just run towards you. So Cassandra cannot do the big jump attack, but she can do the flail and then the run, and she's doing it again. So once again, just stay near the corners and then run away at the right moment and at the right angle. She's doing the big grab, so I gotta run away. Very simple stuff. Nothing very special about that. So it should be a couple more hits, although I, I might have to craft some uh, ammo here. There's always gonna be a situation where I have to craft uh, at least one set of... Uh, hand garden rounds if I need to deal with some of the dollars. But that's it, and that is the end of uh, Castle Dumitresk, and now we have to do uh, Dumitresk herself. Which, like I said, is a very fun fight, but it's a very simple fight, and there's not much to really say about it because you've already understood how it works. I just wish there was more to do with, uh, with Dumitresk. It's just such a shame that a lot of the stuns that you get on hardcore difficulty and lower, a lot of them are just removed, or they are there, but it just... it. Her stun threshold is increased to an absurd degree that you'll never get the chance to see these animations. Just imagine how disappointed the animation department was when they saw these kind of changes on Villager Shadow's difficulty. I, I, I can't imagine being in the animation department, putting a lot of hard work into these uh, very creative animations, and then having the developers say, Oh, let's forget about all that, let's just discard all that, and let's deliver a very simple experience because you don't understand the whole idea of difficulty. Like, if you have to sacrifice features on a higher difficulty, then you might as well just keep those changes on the earlier difficulties. Like, why is it that there are certain developers out there that try to favor these differences on the highest difficulty that have more to do with changes to fundamental designs than actual changes? Like, the changes to the enemy placements is something that I can appreciate on a higher difficulty, but when they remove crucial fundamental mechanics, like with stuns, like, that's honestly something that should be apparent on all difficulties, not specific to one difficulty. Like, fundamental designs are something that indicate that a developer cares about those kind of designs. So, you want to favor designs that the, the developers actually care about, not just favor them on an earlier difficulty and then discard them on a higher difficulty. There's just, there's no thought put into that at all. I guess I don't really see what it adds to the supposed challenge to Villager Shadow's difficulty. Like, the fact that they've removed a lot of these fundamental mechanics on Villager Shadow's difficulty that actually benefits the balance, that actually benefits the actual flow of the gameplay, it, it forces you to be reliant upon exploits. It forces you to be very reliant upon these very awkward, unorthodox strategies that just look so stupid. And they don't make the fights interesting. They don't make the fights look like they were well-designed at all. You're just being heavily reliant upon very simple designs because of the fact that the developers decided to neglect certain designs on higher difficulties. It's just completely unacceptable. Like in Resident Evil 7, on Madhouse difficulty, they don't change any of the fundamental designs. You're still getting the same like feedback systems with the weapons, with, with their damage, with their stuns. It's uniform across all difficulties, so there's at least something to rely upon. There's something that indicates that the developer actually cares about what they're putting into the game. But on Village of Shadows difficulty, there's nothing like that. They just remove so many of these crucial designs that actually influence the basic flow of the gameplay, and when you break that flow, you introduce new problems in your game. You introduce new holes that can screw the player over for no reason, and it's not the player's fault. Or you just allow people to just be very reliant upon the exploit spots, and at that point, are you even playing a game? Are you even playing a fucking game at that point, if you're going to be doing stuff like that? Like, if it just exploits the game. That's what this game can be at times. And it just feels like that's what it is most of the time for like 50% of the game. And then the other 50%, there are times when you're actually playing the game the way it was intended, but with the number of exploits that you're going to be utilizing because of the removal of the fundamental designs, it makes you wonder, is it intentional? 
are the developers trying to make you slot into the exploit areas in order to somehow benefit the natural progression of the game? And that's what the developers wanted to go for? That's just so silly. That is just so comical. That is just something that doesn't allow you to take the developers seriously. Like, that's just a move that the Resident Evil Zero or Resident Evil 2 Remake developers would do. Not the Resident Evil 7 team. And this isn't even made by the Resident Evil 7 team. I, I think this was made by the Resident Evil 2 Remake team. Because there are certain mentalities that Resident Evil 3 Remake didn't have that are present in this game, and they were also in Resident Evil 2 Remake. Like with the removal of the stuns, Resident Evil 2 Remake is the first Resident Evil game where the hardest difficulty removes stuns. Never in any Resident Evil game on the highest difficulty do they ever remove stuns. Why they decided to arbitrarily do it in Resident Evil 2 Remake and it only made you not use the guns any further and it made you so reliant upon running past the enemies and it made you so reliant upon the knife and it just made you so reliant upon exploit areas and it made you so reliant upon finding the simple enemy behaviors that just allowed you to deal with them or just like get past them. Like, I, I never thought Capcom would ever be capable of that and that is when new Capcom was born. And you want to know another reason why I really feel like the Resident Evil 2 Remake team designed this game? It's the challenge that you get in Resident Evil Village, where you have to beat the game knives out, meaning like, with close combat weapons only. Like, in Resident Evil 2 Remake, New Capcom glamorized the whole idea of knife only in Resident Evil 2 Remake, and it really showed because the fundamental designs put in place with Resident Evil 2 Remake, they were befitting for knife only. Every single design was meticulously done to benefit knife only with the enemy placements, with the simple enemy behavior, with the way the environments were laid out. It was all done to benefit knife only. And that is why that game is also very simple. But with this one, for some reason, they decided to glamorize knife only slash close combat weapons only in a game that isn't designed for close combat weapons only. And the fact that that level of glamorization is apparent, but it wasn't apparent in Resident Evil 3 Remake, it leads me to believe that it was the Resident Evil 2 Remake team that developed this game. And while they did get some aspects right with certain parts of Resident Evil Village, for the most part, a large majority of the game, they just got wrong, and that Knives Out challenge was honestly the most insulting challenge I have ever seen for a Resident Evil game. And it is for a game that is not designed with close combat weapons only in mind. This is a game that is built for all the weapons in mind, everything put in place with the enemy types, and the enemy placements, and with the way the enemies are designed. It's all done that way to make you use the guns. Not to use close combat weapons only, and they even acknowledge that there are two parts of the game where you can do a knife only, or a close combat weapons only, and that is the self-propelled artillery in Heisenberg's boss fight, and then the final phase of Miranda. And if they're going to be putting in sequences like that, that aren't designed with close combat weapon only in mind, and they actually represent a vast majority of the percentage in the fights, like with Resident Evil 2 Remake, or like with Resident Evil 2 or with Resident Evil 1 Remake, you know, there were those sequences where you were forced to use the rocket launcher, but that was purely as a way to end a fight, not something that actually contributed to a vast majority of what you were doing in those fights. So that's why those are exceptions, but when you're putting in sequences like the self-propelled artillery sequence in Heisenberg's boss fight, or with, um, with the final phase of Mother Miranda, I mean, uh, maybe with the final phase of Mother Miranda it's different, but even still though, like, when you're putting in those kind of sequences, why do you then try to glamorize the whole idea of close combat weapon only in Resident Evil Village? I and mean, you want to give the enemies a ridiculous amount of life, you want to remove a lot of stun animations, you want to place the enemies the way you do, you want to somehow make it more practical on the easier difficulty, so you're trying to force people to play on an easier difficulty because you don't trust your hardest difficulty at all. Like, why is it that you want people to go and play on a difficulty where the enemies do absolutely nothing and they just stand around and just their, their attacks are just so slow to come out and they just stand there doing absolutely nothing? Like, why do you want the player to go through that kind of difficulty to do a challenge? Do you not know what that challenge is? A challenge is befitting for a harder difficulty, not for an easier difficulty. Do you have any idea how, how paradoxical in thinking that is? Designing a challenge for an easier difficulty? It might as well not be a challenge, you're negating the challenge aspect by doing that. It shouldn't have been designed in the first place. And I've already elaborated on this point ad nauseum in my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough that eventually became my Resident Evil Village Disappointment video about the whole idea of how insulting that challenge was for Knives Out in Resident Evil Village. And 
That's why I really feel like this team that made Resident Evil Village is the same team that made Resident Evil Tournament because they glamorized the whole idea of knife only. I mean, they didn't have the challenge aspect though, so I'm guessing the moment Resident Evil 3 make introduced challenges, they wanted to somehow arbitrarily put in a knives out challenge for Resident Evil Village and just completely undermine all the designs put in place with this game. Like, that level of disrespect and that level of insult coming from new Capcom is something that was apparent in Resident Evil 2 Remake. And I especially remember, like, there were certain interviews that were done with Resident Evil 2 Remake where they talked about the whole idea of shots feeling very believable in their feedback when in actuality it doesn't translate into gameplay that well on the highest difficulty. Yet again, another great example of miscommunication involved. And just, just thought processes that don't feel like they're human, they just feel so alien. Like, that alien thinking involved just really makes me feel like it's the Resident Evil 2 Remake team that designed this, not the Resident Evil 3 Remake team. And there were some elements of Resident Evil 2 Remake's design philosophies present in Resident Evil 3 Remake, and that's why the holes of Resident Evil 2 Remake brought down that game, but overall, I just found Resident Evil 3 Remake to be a better game than Resident Evil 2 Remake, just with some of the designs put in place, and the fact that that game was not designed for Knife Only, and they didn't try to glamorize Knife Only in Resident Evil 3 Remake, but they do it here. How does that make any sense? Like, there's just the level of insanity involved with Resident Evil Village, with its storytelling, with its gameplay, and with its other aspects. It's like, it's a joke, as I'm going to mention for the umpteen time. And, like, th there's just a lot more I need to discuss about this, but I'll elaborate further when I get the chance. And we're about to finish off uh, Lady Domitrescu in a very fun encounter. And here's this last phase right here, which is very simple. You'll notice I'm being a lot more aggressive when shooting her in this last phase compared to the previous phases. Uh, that's because I didn't realize is how uh, generous uh, Lady Dumitresk is when doing her attacks. Like, even if you uh, like move around a lot, as long as you're staying on one half of the area, you can really influence what direction she tries to attack towards. So that's why I was able to shoot her and, and still move at the same time before her attack even came out. And we finally finished her off in a very fun sequence. Like, this will never get old. Just going through this is just so enjoyable every time I hear it. I'm just giddy with joy just watching these cutscenes and just hearing Lady Domitresk with her dialogue. She has some really nice dialogue in this part right here, and I, I love this where you just, they both fall down and Ethan survives, and he does such a crazy thing for an individual who's only encountering BOWs for the second time. <laughs> it's crazy just how much Ethan Winters encounters in this first and second time fighting BOWs, and this boss fight really captured that feeling, and I really acknowledged that to, at length in my blind playthrough of Resident Evil Village. But Lady Dumitress is done, and we are now going to move on to the next area. And the next area, of course, is the village area. And we're just going to be doing some minor encounters with the Lycans. Does anyone actually like the village? Let me just ask that question right there, because... In all honesty, guys, in my opinion, I, just, I don't feel like the village really offers anything really intriguing that really makes you want to explore it. Like, aside from the occasional ammunition drops and some files, like, like some very minor files that don't exactly detail much, there's not much to really do in the village area. There's not really any kind of special um, ex exploration of the environment within the village area. There's no kind of walls you can break down. There's no kind of unique animations that trigger. There's nothing really creative with the enemies. And speaking of which, did you see that just then? That right there was a bow and arrow guy and an armored lichen. And those two enemies only appear on Village of Shadows difficulty. But as you saw just then, all I did was just run right past them. Remember how I mentioned that a lot of the enemy placements on Village of Shadows difficulty are entirely negligible and they don't really serve that much of a purpose? That's one of them. This notion of putting in enemies in sequences where you're already going to be running right past them because it's just a lot more efficient given that the combat on this game is shit and you know it's designed that way to make the enemies despawn and just give yourself an easier time. Like, why do you do that for an enemy placement on Village of Shadows difficulty? That I just don't understand. And there are so many enemy placements like that on Village of Shadows difficulty. Like this upcoming sequence, there is a moment where you take this path in order to get to a door that has an iron insignia on it, and from that iron insignia door, you gain access to the well wheel. And if you take that path after you use the jack handle, you will encounter a couple of lichens, an armored lichen, and a bow and arrow guy. And that bow and arrow guy only appears on Village of Shadows difficulty. But the thing is, you can skip that spawn. And even when you don't skip the spawn, if you get up on that roof, 
he goes away. He doesn't try to attack you the moment you get on the roof, so why put him there? And furthermore, why even put these enemies here in the first place? There's just, you're going to be running right past them anyway, and it's just a lot better to use exploits, because the combat on this game is so bad. And this right here is another great example. So, I'm going to kill this Lycan right here, and I'm going to use the code in order to gain access to the Jack Handle, as well as the M1911. But the thing is, Lycan spawn after you do that, and why do they put them there? This is a very shit area to fight these Lycans, and I guarantee you guys, you will never survive this sequence, or even have a good time, using the fundamental mechanics and your weapons in order to deal with these enemies. Because the Lycans gain so much hyper armor, they just they take forever, they die, they spam grab like crazy, whenever they're together, and they do all their different attacks that you just cannot avoid, the combat just really falls apart. Like, why do you put those enemies there? Like, the game is forcing you to run right past these enemies. If you're going to be running right past them, why do you put them there? It just it makes no sense at all. But something to bear in mind, this is where uh, a major deviation from my previous uh, versions of this walkthrough is going to be noticeable. Because I'm actually going to be using the M1911 as I just acknowledged. I didn't actually realize how useful the M1911 was. And in my blind playthrough, when I looked at the power stats for the M1911, it said it was 160. And... For the previous uh, Lemmy pistol that I had, when I had the attachment on it, it said 130 plus 30, so I assumed it meant it was 160 in damage, but that's not the case. The plus 30 just means that the attachment gives you plus 30, but the damage that you get on your Lemmy when you put that attachment on is actually 130. So I misinterpreted what that meant, but really it should have been communicated a lot better. You know, when I see 130 plus 30, I assume it means, oh, it's, it's 160. But because of that, I just I didn't use the uh, M1911 in my blind playthrough. But don't sleep on the M1911. It's actually a, a really decent pistol. In fact, it's absolutely ridiculous with its fire rate. This pistol is probably the fastest pistol I've ever seen in the entire Resident Evil series. And of course, when you're looking at the, the pistols in Resident Evil 6, you can really mash the R2 like crazy and get very fast fire rates that way. But when you're just holding the button, the pistol fires like it's an automatic weapon. I've never seen an M1911 fire as fast as this game's M1911. And, you know, I hear a lot of people saying that the M1911 is ridiculous, and at first hearing that, I'm just like, what are these people talking about? It's just a pistol. It's, and, you know, like, the fire rate isn't going to help that much. But then when I realized you could actually hold the button down in order to fire, that's really when I realized how um, useful the M1911 was. I mean, it's still not going to be the best for dealing damage, but at least its uh, its upgrades are a little bit more reliable compared to the Lemmy. So from this point onward, I'm just going to use the uh, M1911 rather than the Lemmy. And it's actually good because when I do it like that, I effectively sell two weapons and I get a lot more treasure. I mean, I was already getting a lot of treasure anyway in the previous uh, versions of this walkthrough. Because the treasure is just very accessible. And really, if the treasure is going to be that accessible, then... Why is it that you bother putting in the merchant and then you make it such an integral part of the natural progression system? Like I said, it just feels like Occam's Razor. You use such a convoluted explanation like that rather than the simplest explanation. I mean, if the treasure is going to be this easy to access and getting stuff from the merchant is very easy to access, then it's just redundant to put in the merchant system in the treasure anyway. You could easily get the same experience by just, you know, like making it very similar to hardcore difficulty without the merchant, or, you know, adjusting the parameters of this game to feel more like Resident Evil 7 with its balance. Because that game doesn't rely upon a stupid merchant system to deliver a very convoluted explanation to get the same outcome. <laughs> so, re really, that just that's just silly. But going back to what I was saying, like, the ability to sell the Lemmy and the shotgun, and then just gaining, like, new pistols and new shotguns is really handy in allowing you to farm for more treasure. But another thing I was going to mention about the M1911 is that it has a higher clip capacity compared to the Lemmy, because the extended mag that you get in Moreau's area, it allows you to effectively get 17 pistol bullets if you have been contributing to the clip capacity upgrade in the Merchant system. So it's a pretty reliable tool, but then when I get to Heisenberg's factory and I do some minor sequences, and then I go into the dark area, in order to create the key for Heisenberg's area. I just discard the M1911 entirely because the pistols from that point onward don't have any kind of functionality because the rest of your weapons will suffice. 
But the M1911 is a pretty reliable tool for a vast percentage of the game before Heisenberg's area. So use that instead of the Lemmy, even though I do still find the Lemmy to be pretty useful. But going back to what I was saying about the Lycans, you know, like I said, a lot of the enemy placements involving the Lycans and with the other enemies, they just don't feel intelligent in the slightest. And when the game is making it where the combat is shit, and they're placing enemies in situations where the combat just really falls apart, and it's just better to run away. What is the whole point of putting those enemies there? You, you know, you see what I mean? It just, it doesn't serve any purpose. It just, it's completely redundant. It just, it, there's no, like, way to contribute to the gameplay flow when you're putting in those enemies because you're already going to be running right past them. And it's just interesting that I say this, because for Beneviento's area and for Moreau's area, you, you just won't be encountering that many enemies. And I just find it very odd how much this game flip-flops between introducing a lot of enemies, but then putting in sequences where you're not really encountering any enemies. You know, I just, I just feel like the, the enemy placements are all over the place, and they just vary in their intelligence, and... There's never really any moment in this game where I feel like the enemy placements are intelligent, and at the same time, even when the enemies aren't really placed in a way that feels broken and just poorly implemented, they don't provide enough of an impact to really make them feel memorable. And really the only time I actually felt like an enemy placement had a lot of meaning to it was when you beat Moreau's area and you return to the village area, you can go to Louise's house, and the enemy placement that they favor for that sequence is a Varkalak Alpha, a single Varkalak Alpha patrolling the fields. And that's really the only time this game actually feels like it embraces a very intelligent enemy placement. It's just a shame it doesn't have a lot of impact because it doesn't change between Hardcore difficulty and Village of Shadows difficulty. Like, there's no real change from just tons of enemies being dotted all over the place to just one single enemy that's intelligently placed. And I just feel like with that sequence, it's intelligent because it benefits the survival horror aspect and it shows that the developers have a lot of confidence in one of their enemy types actually delivering something satisfying. And it's intimidating. Like, the only time you ever see the Varkalak Alpha when it's inside the fields is when you see the spears just hovering above the fields. And, like, the, the spears that are just embedded within the Varkalak Alpha. I think, I think the intimidation factor involved with that enemy placement is perfect. And... The, the Varkalak itself is probably my favorite enemy type in the game because it actually feels like it's a Resident Evil enemy. It's actually intimidating. It looks scary. It looks bestial. It's eyes. Those eyes that the Varkalaks have, those eyes are horrifying. And I've seen the death animation that plays when Ethan gets killed by a Varkalak and the moment where the Varkalak places its claw on Ethan and you just see its eyes. Those eyes are easily the most intimidating eyeballs I have ever seen in the entire Resident Evil series. But at least with the Varkalak, it's a scary enemy, but it's also a really well-designed enemy. Because as I've demonstrated, you can counter the Varkalaks by using your shotgun. They, they put in a Resident Evil design with that Varkalak. A, a design that only Resident Evil would do. You don't see any other game favor a very specific kind of design specific to a weapon that allows you to elicit a very specific kind of feedback on an enemy. You can counter two of the Varkalak's long-range attacks to knock it over. And even when you're in, up close, if the Varkalak tries to grab you, if you block it, you don't take any damage. That is really well designed, and I just find it very funny. How you can block the Varkalax grab and not incur any damage, yet the Lycans, and the Lycans are kind of a pre-evolved state to the, to the Varkalak, you can't block their grab and avoid damage. How does that make any sense? A Varkalak is seemingly stronger than a Lycan, yet you can block its grab and not take any damage, yet it's not the same case with the Lycans. So it almost gives the illusion that the Lycans are stronger than the Varkalaks, but that, that, just, that doesn't make any sense. It goes against the very nature of the evolutionary stages involved with how the Lycans evolve. It's, it just it makes no sense at all. But as I was saying, like, the Varkalaks are really the only good enemy type in this game, and they don't feel so forgettable, and they actually feel like they have a bit of an impact, despite the fact that they only appear in a couple of sequences. Like, if that enemy type was used a little bit more in this game, and they actually presented as a little bit more of a threat, I think this could have been a very fun enemy to experiment with. But as it stands, the, the Varkalax only appear in sequences where combat just really isn't encouraged against them, and it's just better to run right past them or use stealth. I mean, the stealth aspect I'm, I'm perfectly okay with, 
But there has to be at least one sequence where the Varkalax somehow presents itself as a threat in a way that actually feels logical. And I'm not talking about moments where, like for instance in Resident Evil 2 Remake, where you solve that medallion puzzle that allows you to gain access to the Maiden Medallion, and then a liquor spawns from the ceiling and it just knows where you are even when you walk out. I'm not talking about moments like that. I'm just saying, like, put in a situation where the Varkalak actually is a bit more of a threat and, like, combat is an inevitability, but if you use the mechanics of Resident Evil intelligently, you can get past that enemy, and it, it encourages a little bit more skill. Like, I just feel like there's a little bit more intelligence displayed with how the Varkalax are designed than with any other enemy type in this game. And as I mentioned before in my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, my, my most recent walkthrough, either the enemy types on this game are poorly designed, forgettable, or just impractical to deal with. And... I just feel like the, the Varkalax are a little bit more impractical to deal with than with the other cases. But they're just a really cool enemy, and I do like them. And also, by the way, I have skipped Beneviento's area because there's no threats. I'm a little disappointed that we didn't really encounter any kind of unique enemy types with uh, Beneviento. But I'm guessing with the way Beneviento's character is presented, she doesn't really seem like the type to really use like different enemies. Although the dolls could have been a very uh, interesting enemy to deal with. Like, you're just, you're, you're sneaking through Beneviento's house, and then out of nowhere, a doll that has the Kadu implanted within it just attacks you. Similar to, like, what the Amadudos did in Resident Evil 4, where they had the Las Plagas embedded within them, and the Las Plagas were able to give the suits of armor a range of motion to become the Amadudos. I mean, I do feel like the Amadudos are not really used that well in Resident Evil 4. I mean, the Ashley sequence, I feel like they're used fine. But the combat encounter involved with them, where you're in that little tiny room, it's not very good in Resident Evil 4. So, the, I don't feel like the Amadudos were used that well. But, you know, they could have done something a little bit more with Beneviento's area. I mean, I do like that the, they focused on uh, changing up the gameplay a little bit, even though it is a little similar to the main experience. And, you know, they wanted to focus more on the story aspects and really build a lot of empathy with Ethan, which I do appreciate. And I did feel a lot more empathy for Ethan. I did love him a lot more after doing that sequence. But still, though, like, I just, I wish there was a little bit more to do. And then we have Moreau's area here, and Moreau's area is the most disappointing area. Like, we're so far into the game, and you want to design Moreau's area like this? One sequence with lichens, and you put an armored lichen here for no reason, yet you're just going to be picking up the key and then running out of there, and these lichens are so slow to deal with you. And it, I, should, I should actually feel grateful for that, though, because the combat against the lichens is shit. But at the same time, the, the fact that they design a lot of these sequences where the enemies are just so easy to run past... And, you know, like, they didn't really bother putting in any new enemy types with uh, Moreau's area, or really giving a lot more complexity to Moreau's area. Like, this is the only time Moreau's area is interesting, when we're doing this little chase sequence. Like, you just, you don't do enough in Moreau's area, they just settle on a very short area, and then they give you a dragged out scenario where you're just dealing with Moreau. And Moreau's boss fight is the most underwhelming part of Resident Evil Village, and it's probably the worst part of Resident Evil Village, alongside Bella's boss fight. And I'm still undecided as to where I should rank uh, Moreau and Bella as being the worst bosses. I don't know which is worse. I don't know if Bella is worse. I don't know if Moreau is worse. I'm just I'm undecided on that. Because, you know, honestly, you guys, they, they feel equally shit. Like, do you take the dragged out scenario with Moreau and he has a lot of really bad designs put in place with his audio and with some of his attacks? Or do you take Bella, which is a shorter fight, but she is so shit in her designs and she's accompanied by enemies that just don't feel befitting for the setting that they put you in? And, you know, just uh, there's so much when it comes to lack of intelligence and lost potential in Resident Evil Village. And this actually leads me on to a tangent I want to discuss, because it has been lingering in my head ever since I did the video. But one of my friends, Ether, he was commenting on my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, and he disagreed with me when I said that the placement of the Fast Molded in the basement area of the Baker household is an intelligent enemy placement. And I'm just like, why? Why is that not intelligent? You, do you really think like putting a bunch of like normal molded in that sequence is a lot more intelligent than putting in one fast molded? And do you have any idea how much the gameplay would have fallen apart? I mean, I reasoned with him on this, and he did see eye to eye in that. But really, you shouldn't be making that kind of statement in the first place. Like, if you have to put in a bunch of enemies in a very poor environment, then it shows that you don't understand how your AI behaves in the game, and you don't understand your own fundamental designs. And furthermore, it, you're, you're not being very confident with your enemies at that point. If you can't trust one single enemy to deliver a very large impact on the player, 
and you're instead opting to just place a bunch of enemies together, or just place them in sequences where the combat just really falls apart, and it doesn't benefit the survival horror aspect, and it just leads to more frustration, then that right there is just a very feeble attempt at implementing a cheap shortcut to actual good game design, and relating this to Resident Evil Village, Look back at that sequence I did earlier, where I picked up the M1911 and all those lichens were just positioned on the rooftops. Because of the fact that the combat on this game really falls apart, and the lichens themselves are very shit enemy, and putting that many enemies in a very shit environment just doesn't work, because of the fact that New Capcom did that, they forced me to run past the enemies, and they forced me to be so reliant upon exploits, they forced me to be so reliant upon holes in the designs, in order to actually somehow make the sequence balanced. Like, doing that just shows the lack of intelligence display with that placement of the enemy, and relating this to the placement of the fast molded in the basin area of the Baker household, that never happens. The fast molded is placed there in order to catch you by surprise, because Madhouse difficulty is a very different experience to normal difficulty. And it, it, it forces you to be very careful, it forces you to understand how the fast molded behave, it forces you to understand how to save on your ammunition intelligently, and it doesn't force you to use exploits to your advantage. It doesn't force you to play the game in a very awkward fashion. Like, that level of intelligence displayed by old Capcom, when they realized that placing a bunch of enemies in a bad environment would lead to problems like that, and so instead they opted to put in one single fast molded, which is incredibly intelligent, that's what I mean when I say that is a very intelligent enemy placement, and it actually benefits the whole idea of making Mana's difficulty a very different experience to normal difficulty. But as I just demonstrated with that one sequence where I ran past those lichens, like, the enemy placements that they favor for this game, they don't deliver it in a way that actually feels intelligent. They don't deliver it in a way that feels different to hardcore difficulty. They deliver it in a way that just feels very awkward. And any developer that actually takes their game seriously would never try to do that. And on the mechanical side, like, putting in that many enemies in the basement area of the Baker household, the gameplay would have just fallen apart. And as I said before, it just leads to a lack of understanding as to how the game works. Like, difficulty shouldn't be about just blatantly just making the game difficult for the sake of being difficult. There's a level of intelligence displayed with the highest difficulty that shows that the developers understand how their game works. And placing one single fast molded in the basement area just shows that, the, that old Capcom knows how to like, understand their game. They understand how their game works. And that's why that placement works. So... When Ether makes a statement like that, I just I wonder what he means by intelligent enemy placements, and I just wonder why he disagreed with me on that. Because the combat in Resident Evil 7, like the combat is good, but it's only good up to a certain degree. Whereas in Resident Evil Village's case, I mean I just I don't find the combat to be good at all. The combat just isn't satisfying regardless of the, the degrees to which you fight enemies. Whereas in Resident Evil 7's case, as I, as I just explained, the combat's only good up to a certain degree, but placing like so many enemies in, in, a, in a single room, the combat would have just fallen apart. And you, you don't have the systems to actually balance out those kind of moments. At least in the Not A Hero DLC, they give you the systems necessary to warrant those moments where you're, you're surrounded by mold and you have to deal with them. Or in the End of Zoe DLC, I mean the End of Zoe DLC is probably not the best example of this, but the Not A Hero DLC is a better choice. So... Ether, if you happen to watch this video, I, I wish you would like give this a little bit more thought. And I just, I, I really wonder why you consider that placement to be unintelligent, because that placement of like so many molded in the basement area would just lead to mechanical problems. It would lead to just very poor mentalities being established. And putting in so many enemies in the basement area of the Baker household that just feels like new Capcom design, not old Capcom design. And, you know, as someone who really values, like, good designs in a game, and, and you've demonstrated this to me so many times, like, you, you really should understand what I mean when I say that enemy placement is very intelligent, and why a lot of the enemy placements in Village of Shadows difficulty and Resident Evil Village, and in this game overall, just aren't very intelligent. So, that's all I have to say about that, and now we're fighting Moreau, and I'm taking a cue from Ether right here, and I'm doing the mine strategy, where I'm going to place a bunch of mines near this explosive barrel, but instead of running away, I'm going to stand right here, because what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to bait Moreau to do his slam attack, because what happens is, when Moreau does his slam attack, he exposes his weak spot, and if you get the explosions correctly, you can hit his weak spot with the explosions and do like triple damage to him, but I fucked it up just then. 
And really, I, I don't really see myself ever doing this trick again because it just presents with so much RNG. I mean, I'll still place the mines there next to the explosive barrel because at least it's a lot more damage than what I'll be doing with my guns. But, you know, baiting out his slam attack and then getting him to actually land on top of the mines, it's very tricky to do. And if I placed my mines a lot better, maybe I could have gotten better results, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not willing to take that risk because I, I don't want to replay this fight. Like, this fight is just such a waste of time. They could have done so much more in Moreau's area, but instead they just favored this very shit boss fight. And this is honestly the worst boss fight ever made in the entire Resident Evil series. This is 2021, and they're still favoring this very shit design with the bosses. Like, this game probably has some of the worst boss design philosophies I've ever seen. And Heisenberg's boss fight and Lady Dumitress's boss fight and Acacia Mother Miranda's boss fight, those are really the only exceptions to the boss design philosophy that they favor with this game. Oh, but minus uh, Beneviento's uh, boss fight, because that is a gimmick fight. And I get what they're doing there, because a lot of psychological horror boss fights, uh, they aren't so much boss fights, they were more so gimmick fights. You know, I, I'm, I think that's really the case with Silent Hill as well, because a lot of times with Silent Hill bosses, you just find this very cheesy thing to do against the bosses that just works because of how simple the enemies are. But, you know, it's not so much the same case here with Beneviento's area, because, I mean, with Beneviento's boss fight, you know, it's more so, like, cutscenes. And, you know, it's not something very stupid where you just gotta place yourself in some really stupid positions or just, like, mash enemies down or just, like, bait out one single attack like in Silent Hill. You know, it's just a, it's a presentation fight more so in uh, Beneviento's case. So I'm willing to give it that, but as a fight, uh, maybe it's not, maybe it's best if I don't put Beneviento's boss fight alongside the other bosses I've just listed. They've actually displayed very good boss design philosophies. But, like, the, the bosses on this game have way too much life. And Moreau is just a bullet sponge, all because they wanted to take pity on this guy. And yes, I know that, you know, Mother Miranda doesn't really view Moreau as being an exceptional subject. And, you know, Moreau just has abandonment issues, and he's essentially like a child in an adult body. And, you know, it feels like we should pity him, this and that, but don't make it where he has this much life. You know, I'd actually pity him a lot more if he had less life, and his fight was a lot more interesting and better designed. Like, this right here, just... All the feelings I had for Moreau initially are just lost in this very pathetic excuse for a boss fight. And you know, like, those moments in the concept art for Moreau's boss fight, where he was going to originally be portrayed as, uh, do watching romance films and eating cheese, like, that just sounds like such a cute moment to put for this kind of, uh, boss figure. And, you know, it really benefits the, the childish fantasies that Moreau has, because, you know, like, teenage romances, those are definitely going to be a part of those kind of fantasies. And, you know, there was, there was originally a whole idea for Moreau to be in love with a girl, and that girl would actually be attached to his back because he didn't want to let her go. But that eventually became the Kadu Parasite. You know, I do, I do find the whole idea of the Kadu Parasite to be a lot better than uh, putting a girl on his back. But, you know, like, the whole idea of the romance films and uh, the cheese that he eats, that just... That's such a cute moment for this kind of character, you know? Moreau does display some very cute moments with his dialogue, and I especially love the whole dialogue that he does where he's like, Don't you love me, mother? Whenever he's chasing you in the first phase of this boss fight, because there's something cute about that line that I really love. But sadly, that's all thrown away when you realize how shit this boss fight is, with the amount of poor designs present, with his own attacks, with the audio, and with how much life that he has. It's just, it's like the similar progression with Salazar, but Moreau isn't built up as much as Salazar, but with Salazar in Resident Evil 4, they built up Salazar so much in, in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 that it really felt like there was going to be this penultimate showdown with Salazar that'd be so memorable, but sadly, instead, what we get is you stand on a platform, you stay near the back area, and Salazar does only one attack. And if you stay in the back area, you won't have to deal with the stupid tentacle attacks that have shitty QTEs and very poor detection on their hitboxes. And if you run out of ammo, you then have to go down and deal with the Plaga Type Cs and hope they drop ammunition because for some reason they don't bother favoring set ammo placements or consistent ammo drops whenever you kill a Plaga Type C. You have to get lucky. And it just it makes that fight a chore. It turns it into an absolute chore. There's nothing created with Salazar's boss fight. Like, Salazar was done so poorly in Resident Evil 4 with his ending. They really didn't do Salazar any justice. Um, it's, it's the same case here in Moreau, only Moreau doesn't have the same level of build-up. And like I said before, if you just did more in Moreau's area, in his area what could be equally as intriguing as Dummy Tress area or Heisenberg's factory, and you had a lot more moments with his character and his boss fight was shorter but better designed, this could have been a very memorable encounter, but it's not. 
And I just killed him right there. So that was a very short fight because of the fact that I was actually dealing a lot of damage and I had the tools necessary to do it. But even still, though, it just feels like a very long fight. They really did this boss poorly. This is honestly the worst boss ever made in the entire Resident Evil series, with just the amount of lost potential, the fact that he takes place in a shit area, the fact that he has hitbox issues and audio problems, the, the fact that his character isn't built up very well. Like, everything that has nothing to do with the gameplay, and everything to do with the gameplay, all of that just compounds in the very shit mess of a boss fight. It is so disappointing. That is the biggest, like, down for this entire game. That is the biggest thumbs down I'm going to give this game when it comes to a boss design. And what a shame that Ethan Winters had to go through that kind of shit boss fight just to progress with the game. Like, they do the rest of the bosses a little bit better. I mean, Orius is still a shit fight, but he does have some cool designs with him. And then Heisenberg is the best boss of this entire game. And Sturm is a very fun fight as well. And then Mother Miranda is a fun fight as well, despite her problems. Like, they do those bosses a little bit better than Moreau. How is that possible? Like, again, it just goes back to the whole idea of the amount of inequality present with the bosses and with their areas. Like, you spend so much more time in Domitresque and Heisenberg's area, and Domitresque is a fun fight, Heisenberg is a fun fight, and then you don't spend as much time in Beneviento and Moreau's area, and Beneviento is a decent fight, despite the fact that it is a gimmick fight, and then Moreau is just a shit fight, and you don't do anything in Moreau's area. And I'm not factoring Beneviento's area in this case, because it's meant to be a psychological horror moment, and of course you don't really do a lot in uh, psychological horror moments. But at least it delivered on something important, which is building my empathy and love towards Ethan Winters, and making him my favorite Resident Evil protagonist of all time. But the fact that it satisfied that makes me love Beneviento's boss fight. But there's nothing redeemable about Moreau's boss fight at all, and there's nothing redeemable about Moreau's area at all. It's the worst area of the entire game, and so many people agree with me on this. Like, this game really had to be delayed. This game needed more time, more thought, more creativity, just more. More better designed enemies, more creative areas, more interesting modifiers for Villager Shadow's difficulty, more time with the villains and with other characters like with Chris and Mia. Like, they needed more time to actually flesh out the story, they needed more time to flesh out the gameplay, they needed more time to flesh out the characters. That's why I say this game needs more, and I've never experienced this so much with any other Resident Evil game. Minus Resident Evil 1 Remake and Resident Evil 2 Remake, of course, but you can't even apply that whole argument of wanting more in those games, because those games only settle for less. And when the goal of a developer is to settle for less in those kind of games, like before those games are even designed, you can't even bring up that whole argument. Like, those games, Resident Evil 1 Remake and Resident Evil 2 Remake, were built to be settled for less. They, they built that game to not do a lot with their designs or with anything else. So, I can't even apply that whole argument. But with every other Resident Evil game, there's, it's always felt like enough. Um, I mean, minus some moments where I really feel like some sequences should have been removed, or some enemy types should have been removed, or any chances to actually, like, remove certain unnecessary story moments. But with this game... This is the one Resident Evil game where I feel like more was needed to really make this a revolutionary title. It's a game to kickstart the generation of PS5. And I was really hoping this game would really stretch the margin on PS5. I was hoping this would kickstart a new generation of survival horror. I was hoping this would kickstart a new generation of Resident Evil. But it hasn't. It hasn't done any of that at all. This game just leaves me hanging, it just, it leaves me with more questions, it leaves me with more to really talk about when it comes to problems and actual, like, good things. It's, it's unbelievable that they forced me to do this with this game. I've just, I've never been so disappointed with a Resident Evil game, but I still can't find myself to hate this game more than Resident Evil 2 Remake and Resident Evil 1 Remake. Like, there are some shit Resident Evil games out there for sure that feel worse than this. It's just, this game offers more disappointments than any other Resident Evil game because of the fact that I had such high expectations for this game. And such high expectations were justified by the fact that New Capcom put a lot of emphasis on this game being a very ambitious title and they even said this would be their best survival horror game to date. And when I was seeing the initial gameplay, when I was seeing the interviews that New Capcom did with other interviewers, it really gave out that kind of vibe. Something that I feel like old Capcom would have done. Something that really feels like they aren't trying to cling to old school mentalities. They aren't trying to cling to what works like they did with Resident Evil 2 Remake in order to deliver a satisfying Resident Evil experience. And like, change is the law of life when it comes to Resident Evil and the changes they were listing before Resident Evil Village released were very ambitious changes. 
But then when I played the demos, and then when I played the full game, I just, I don't feel like any of that was satisfied with this game. This is not a new generation of survival horror, this is not a new generation of Resident Evil. It's just a very shallow excuse for a Resident Evil game, despite the fact that it has its charms. Charms that are more appealing than anything in Resident Evil 2 Remake and Resident Evil 3 Remake. And I hope when I do my review of Resident Evil Village, I'll actually get a lot of these thoughts put together into one comprehensive video. I don't even know how long the review is going to be when I do it. But there's just so much to say about this game when I get the chance, and after the DLC releases, that's when I'll start my review. I mean, maybe I should compile my thoughts right now, because, you know, I've made so many videos just talking about my thoughts on Resident Evil Village. But when I do my review, I just, I just hope I'll get some amount of closure at actually finally setting in stone my thoughts on Resident Evil Village into a nice bow and ribbon with that review. Because... I just feel like I'm fluctuating between whether to fully hate this game or whether to fully like this game. But that's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, right now we're doing the stronghold like an encounter, which is very simple. That initial fight is very easy. Just bait out the running grab and then strafe away because that's the only way to avoid that. And then use this shotgun, which is very strong against the lichens because two shots to the head is enough to kill them. Uh, this right here, I'm going to use the mechanic where I'm going to shoot the enemies off the ledge when they climb. Uh, this only works with a shotgun, and it only works at a very specific point in their animation. Uh, that right there, I don't know why that didn't work, just and that should have worked, but I think it only works if you aim for the head. If you aim for the head, it seems to guarantee that they fall off a little bit more. And I need to use an explosive barrel right there. This is not the best example of really good combat. And um, this could have been the perfect time to actually experiment a little bit more with the counter system, but of course, I was playing very seriously because you know, I don't try to explore those kind of avenues whenever I'm doing walkthroughs of a game. Because I, I'm just plain and simple, I'm, I'm very serious when it comes to uh, doing these kind of walkthroughs. That I don't really have the time to go on these kind of deviations. But after I eliminate those lichens, I go up here and place mine. So that when I uh, deal with the lichens that spawn after I hit this switch right here, uh, after the previous switch, I'll know when to hit the explosive barrel and I'll have plenty of time to stay up there and the lichens will not be able to ambush me. And there's some opportunities to pick up some ammunition and some treasure. There's some sniper rifle ammo up here. And then we're going to be able to hit this. And then you need to make a mad dash towards the ladder. There aren't any bow and arrow guys, thankfully. Thank God that is the case. Because if there were bow and arrow guys in this sequence, this would be a very shit encounter. So it's nice to see that uh, new Capcom was a little more intelligent when designing this. By not putting in some stupid bow and arrow guys. But this is the part right here. So after hitting this switch right here... I'm going to remain right here, and I'm going to try to prioritize this explosive barrel in order to uh, stop the enemies from ganging up on me whenever I make my way over here. And I'm just going to use an exploit area over here because there's too many enemies, and the combat against the lichens is shit. And the, the shotgun is way too slow, it's not reliable, and it's not even that good at crowd control. Like, you think by putting in this many enemies, they'd make the shotgun a little bit more useful at dealing with these enemies. I mean, in Resident Evil 6, the shotgun didn't have that wide of a spread, but... It didn't matter because you already had a lot of systems put in place to balance out the number of enemies you were dealing with. In Resident Evil 4 and in Resident Evil 5, the shotgun had a widespread and knocked over enemies because of the fact that the combat systems were expansive, but not really as expansive as Resident Evil 6's combat systems. But why is it that this game doesn't really favor that option in Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 5's choice of shotgun? Like the shotgun on this game, it doesn't knock over your enemies properly, it doesn't have that wide of a spread, it's only useful when you actually aim for the head on the lichens, and it's completely useless against the Moriakas, and for the most part the Moriakas are just very easy to run past, there's never a situation where you have to deal with them. And you can deal with them, but it's just a chore at that point. Like the, the shotgun just needed a lot more work in this game, and the shotgun from Resident Evil 7 is better than the shotgun on this game. The fact that a shotgun in a game where there aren't as many enemies as there are in Resident Evil Village can be a lot better than the shotgun that's embraced in Resident Evil Village, it's mind-blowing to say the least. But this right here, I'm going to use the normal grenades, far better than using the shotgun. And I'm going to wait right here a little bit so that there aren't any enemies. I had to restart the checkpoint because I failed the sequence because I went a little too fast. And now I'm just going to use a pipe bomb here, and I'm going to throw it at the lichens that appear. Like, why do they put all these enemies here if it's just going to be this easy to run past them? Like, it's, it's like New Capcom is just aware that they program the Lycan so shit that they don't even make them that viable of a threat. And, you know, it's good that uh, you can do this, uh, you can save up on your ammo, but I'm guessing that's another reason as well, it's to ensure that you have enough ammo for the damage sponge bosses coming up. I mean, they aren't as damage spongy as Moreau, but they're still damage sponges nonetheless. 
Like, I just don't understand why they advertise in the concept art that this would be a very hectic encounter when in actuality you're just running right past everything like you've been doing through the full game and like what you've been doing in Resident Evil 2 Remake. And I have gone out of my way to try to kill all those enemies in a, in a fun run where I just do that whole entire room and just use all my ammo without taking any damage. And I, I do see some strategies there with knowing when to use the grenade launcher, but it's impractical and it just it wastes so much time when it's just better to use that option. So it's like, why put these enemies here? I don't know. But now we have Aureus, and I've changed up my strategy against Aureus drastically. So the first time I encounter Aureus, the strategy is very different to what I do. Rather than actually going behind Aureus and baiting out his back attack, I'm going to actually stay in front of him because baiting out his back attack is very dangerous. There is no telling what move he does, and running past him can be tricky because you can only run past him by running around his left side. Because if you go to his right side, which is where his uh, the end of his hammer is, he's very keen on doing a very fast attack to get you off of him. So it presents with a lot of flaws, which is why I'm doing this. So after he does his big slam, I'm going to stand right in front of him because I know he will always do that move. I need to stand right in front of his left leg, and this is a strategy inspired by Urias Straw here. So ironically, because of the fact that I did Urias Straw here knife only, because of the fact that you only have the Karambit for that sequence, and you know they want you to do, to do the game knives out, which is ridiculous, given that Urias Straw here is a 20-minute fight using the Karambit only when you're playing as Chris. I was able to develop this method which I take no pleasure from at all. The fact that I had to play the game in a very unorthodox fashion to really see the holes involved with Urius's designs, that is just, that's really bad. Of course, can you really consider this a hole, though? I mean, he's doing an attack, and I'm actually dodging it. So, really, it's not a hole. It's just the fact that I understand this pattern, and I'm taking the time to put myself in a position where I can avoid that move. And, by the way, as the fight progresses, there are times when after Urius does the the little swipe that he does whenever you're right in front of his uh, left leg, he'll sometimes repeat it. And there are also times where he can hit you randomly when he does that, and I don't know why that happens. And Ether has mentioned that when you do fire your gun, or whenever you do any kind of specific action, where you press R2, your hitbox kind of shifts. And when your hitbox kind of shifts, it, it leads to a lot of moments where a lot of phantom range seems to happen. And that's probably one of the main reasons why I get those moments, where Bella just hits me with Phantom Range on her combo. That, and it's also because the hitbox is poorly programmed. But that might be the reason why I get moments where, even when I'm standing right in front of Urias' left leg and I'm crouched and he can't hit me, there are times when he just randomly hits me. But whenever he does the swipe a second time, you'll want to back away from him, because most likely he will do the big slam that you can't avoid unless you just run away from it. And also, when he goes into this phase, when he roars, you want to use a flash grenade, and he'll prioritize his moveset. And I only use my sniper rifle and my other weapons whenever he uh, goes into that phase, because his moves are very easy to avoid. I think when Aureus goes into this phase, where after he just flails his weapon about, he goes into a different stance. When he goes into that stance, I feel like his moves are better designed compared to his normal stance. But after a certain amount of time, he goes back into his normal stance, and I use another flash grenade, and then I just unload on them with the Magnum. In my previous versions of my walkthroughs, you've seen me just utilizing the, uh, the Magnum almost immediately after he goes into that phase of flailing his weapon about, and after I use the flashbang. I've stopped doing that, because I've come to understand just how fair his moveset is whenever he goes into his alternate stance. Because he isn't so bullshit with a lot of his moves, and the fact that he can't do any of his spinning attack and nonsense and just, cl and just go past the geometry, it's nice that he can't do that during his alternate phase. And, you know, he has a lot of recovery during his moves in his alternate phase. And his running attack that he does in his alternate phase, it doesn't track you, which I find it very odd that it doesn't track you. The fact that it doesn't track you is really well designed, because there have been other running attacks in this game that have tracked you, and it's pretty bullshit. But the fact that his moveset is well designed, that's why I use my other weapons, and then when he goes back into his normal stance, I use another flash grenade, and then I just use my Magnum on him, and I just Magnum dump him in the face, and it allows me to save up on a lot more Magnum ammo, because the Magnum is very, very helpful when dealing with Sturm. And we're now in Heisenberg's factory, and these enemies appear in uh, Heisenberg's factory on the Older Shadows difficulty whenever you're running away from Sturm. Like, can you really consider this a significant enemy change? I mean, I know one of my subscribers, uh, LifeFailout000, he mentions that he likes that change, but... It's not that impactful of a change, I mean, you already have enough explosives, and 
it still feels like Occam's razor of just using a very convoluted explanation rather than a simple explanation to just get the same outcome of just getting past that whole entire chase sequence. Like, that's what I mean when I say it's not very impactful. So I don't agree with my subscriber that that enemy placement is significant. But we're now moving on with uh, Heisenberg's factory, and we have a couple of these haulers to deal with. I'm going to kill them with my pistol because these enemies will appear when you go back to the area when it's dark. And this is the power of the, uh, the M1911. And I'm not really going for the head because I, I don't really feel like the headshots do much against these enemies. And I'm not going to waste time with the knife because, you know, as I mentioned before, the M1911 and the pistols, they don't really serve that much of a purpose in Heisenberg's factory aside from shooting switches. Which is why I'm going to discard it near the end of Heisenberg's factory. And that right there was a soul that Panzer just sitting right in front of the casting machine. I know there are people who say that the Soldat Panzer being there is a significant enemy placement rather than a negligible enemy placement, but I would still consider him to be a negligible enemy placement. Like, he exists solely for making you stay in the area for longer, rather than actually changing up your approach to Heisenberg's factory. I mean, you're still going to be approaching Heisenberg's factory the same way you've been approaching it on hardcore difficulty. Like, this is really the only enemy placement that they really do for Heisenberg's factory. And I think also, uh, for the room that has the two Soldat Jets, they do put in a Soldat Zvi at the bottom area, but I don't know if that's also the case on Hardcore Difficulty and Lower. And um, again, it's another negligible enemy placement because there's never any moment where you're going to be going back down. Who is going to waste time trying to attack those Soldat Jets in that room? And who's going to waste time dealing with the Soldat Panzer when it's just so easy to get past them? So, like, I, I don't agree that the Soldat Panzer is in any way a significant enemy placement. It's an entirely negligible enemy placement because there's so many ways of just using methods that work on multiple enemies and just making the Soldat Panzer a part of that group. And I think uh, flash grenades also affect Soldat Panzers. So when you go back to that area when it's dark, you can just use a flash grenade to stun the, uh, the Berserk Soldat Eins and also the, the Soldat Panzer. I mean, I, don't, I personally don't recommend doing it, because by the time you've gone to pick up the long barrel for the Magnum, they would have already recovered, and they'll be right in front of the casting machine, so it'll be a little bit harder in, in that regard. And even when you don't use the flash, uh, when the Soldat Panzer gets to you, he just busts down that door in order to get to you, and you're, if you're fast when getting the long barrel and getting back to that door, you can just get past him the moment he bashes down the door. So... I don't consider that to be a significant enemy placement. That's an entirely negligible enemy placement, and that's all I'm going to say on that. And like I said, there's just only one enemy placement on this entire game that feels like it's significant, but it exists on all difficulties, so it's not worth critiquing, which I've already discussed with the Varkalak Alpha. Like, there's nothing to the enemy placements in Dolores Shadows difficulty that makes it feel worthwhile. Nothing to change up your playstyle and your approach to a section that's different to hardcore difficulty. And, like, they just, they, they just feel like Occam's Razor. Just, you're using a convoluted explanation, rather than a simple explanation, to get the same result. You're still going on, like, the same linear path, but it's just there's some minor distractions here and there. Like, this is not a significant enemy placement at all. It's just there because they wanted to change up the aesthetic of the area. And that's actually the last enemy change that Villager Shadows Difficulty does. So let's actually look over the changes to the enemy placements on Villager Shadows Difficulty. So the first time you notice an enemy change on Villager Shadows Difficulty is in the village area. After the big lichen attack, you notice a lichen in a house that you're never going to go to unless you beat Castle Dumitresk. And then, before Louise's house, you have those lichens and armored lichens being placed there. Again, you just run right past them because, you know, they're just there for the sake of being there. And then, the next enemy change you notice is the Moriekas in Bella's boss fight. Terrible enemy placement, not impressive at all, entirely, like, unintelligent, not that impressive of an enemy placement. Then you have those Moriekas in the courtyard area when you repair your arm. It's, yet again, another negligible enemy choice. It's like someone that fell asleep at the keyboard. Doesn't change up your uh, approach to the section any differently to hardcore difficulty. And then, after you do Castle Damitresk, we go a long way before we actually get to the Stronghold Lycan encounter. 
then they put in armored lichens, two armored lichens that appear when you're inside of the stronghold. And you just run right past them, nothing impressive about them, you just do the same thing that you do on hardcore difficulty, use the grenade launcher and then the pipe bomb, and then after the stronghold lichen encounter we go to Heisenberg's factory, and we get that soldat panzer being placed there, and then we have those minor sequences with the haulers and Sturm's chases, which speaking of which we're about to encounter right now. So, in essence, we have six changes to the enemies in Villager Shadow's difficulty. SIX CHANGES for a game that's less than three hours long. Like, let's look at Resident Evil 7's Madhouse difficulty, for instance. On Resident Evil 7's Madhouse difficulty, they put in a fast-molded in the hallway after you use the Scorpion key door, another fast-molded in the basement area, they rearrange the molded that appear there, and then in Marguerite's area, you have changes to the nest locations, you have a spiked arm molded, you have new placements of those bigger insects, and then we go on to Lucas's area, and Lucas's area, you have new changes to the molded inside of the Baker household. In the barn area, they've added some more uh, fast molded, and they've added some uh, additional fat molded, I mean one fat molded specifically. Then we have the ship and the mine area, and they added new molded, they rearranged them. I don't remember what the molded placements were like on neural difficulty for those sequences, but I am know for sure that Madhouse difficulty definitely made some significant changes to the flow of those encounters. Just look at the amount of stuff I've listed so far for Resident Evil 7's Madhouse difficulty, and let's not forget the DLCs of course, because the DLCs are professional difficulty rearranged so many of the enemy placements on the Not A Hero DLC, and it was the same case for the End of Zoe DLC. Like, look at the amount of stuff! Resident Evil 7 does with its highest difficulty when it comes to enemy placements compared to the six like n insignificant enemy placements that we get on Village of Shadows difficulty for this game. That is so, so hilarious now that I actually think about it. That is so fucking hilarious. That's, that's comical. That is so fucking goofy that they decided to just do a half-assed effort with rearranging the enemies on Village of Shadows difficulty. That is so insulting. When a developer can't even be bothered to make significant enemy changes that actually impact the flow of your gameplay in a way that actually makes it feel different from the earlier difficulties, what does that say? Just, what does that say about new Capcom compared to old Capcom? It's staring you right in the fucking face. You have to be so fucking stupid to not see that kind of difference in quality. Like, and they want to say, oh, we put a lot of hard work into this. You can't even put a lot of hard work into your enemy placements on this game, can you? Yet you put a lot more hard work into your enemy placements on Madhouse difficulty from Resident Evil 7 that were actually way more significant and a lot more intelligent. There wasn't a single moment in Resident Evil 7 where I felt like the enemy placements were unintelligent. Every single one of them felt right. Never any kind of moment like that. And we're now doing the sequence where everything is dark, and we're having to get past the Soldat Ainz and also the Soldat Panzer. And I'm going to use the grenade launcher to stun the Soldat Ainz. I had originally contemplated using a flash grenade, but then I realized, like, if these enemies are lingering around the casting machine, it's going to pose a problem. And the grenade launcher's normal rounds, I have not been using them that much, so this is a perfect opportunity to use them. And I'm just going to take the time to get the customization part for the Magnum that allows it to increase its damage. And I contemplated using the Grenade Launcher here, but then I thought, hey, I'll, I'll include this here, where I actually showcase how to avoid that stupid stab attack. That that stab attack, you can crouch the Soldat Zvi stab attack when, when they use both of their drills, yet you can't crouch under that stab that the Soldat Ions do. You have to run towards their uh, empty hand. That is so stupid. What a broken hitbox. Same with these Berserk enemies. Like, the Berserk enemies do these uh, horizontal attacks, and also uh, a stab attack at the very end, that it looks like you can crouch under, but you actually can't. The, the horizontal attack specifically, it's, it's aiming around like chest height, right? So, in theory, it makes total sense to crouch under that, yet the game doesn't allow you. They hit thin air, and they still get the hit out on you. And it's the same with the stab attack. The stab attack, you can crouch under the tip of the hitbox, but as soon as they get close to you with that stab, you just take damage for no reason. I showcased this in my poor designs of Resident Evil Village Part 1. And we have this last Soldat Panzer right here, which, again, it's a very decent enemy. That's all I'll really say about it. That's what I mentioned about the Soldat Panzer in my Resident Evil 7 walkthrough, because, you know, they sacrifice their attack diversity for invulnerability. And... We're already past him, and we now have Sturm's boss fight, which I'm actually going to use the flash grenades for a change. 
And the flash grenades on this game are very good at stunning Sturm, and they are also very good at stunning every single variant of the Soldat. They are really, really powerful against them. They're stunned for a very long time. It really balances them out with how shitty their hitboxes can be at times. I mean, Sturm's a very fun fight, but the fact that they give you this level of control when at times Sturm can be a little cheesy, and he just his movement doesn't really make any sense at times, and he just runs into walls when he really shouldn't. Like, right here, he can choose to run into the wall on his left, yet it's a narrow corridor. Like, watch this. I use a flash grenade on him, and instead of coming right at me, he chooses to go into a wall. Look, why does he do that? That, that's so stupid, and I'm glad that the flash grenades can do this, because Sturm could also elicit such similar behavior like this when you're not using flashes. Like, they were actually smart enough to put in this kind of system with the flash grenades, because that's the whole point of our Resident Evil design right there. The Resident Evil design to actually give you this level of control, and actually rewarding the player for actually being smart. Because even though this guy doesn't seem like he can see you, he's actually affected by flash grenades, which is really, really cool. It gives you a level of control, it removes a lot of the bullshit from the fight, and it makes it feel like luck is not part of the equation at all. Like, skill is actually involved with actually knowing when to use your resources correctly. Same with this fight right here. This is the best boss in all of Resident Evil Village. This is Heisenberg, and he's a skillfully designed fight. There is actual intelligence here. None of the RPG designs of Resident Evil Village get in the way of this amazing boss fight. And I've actually learned some new things about Heisenberg, which I don't actually display in this video here. But the main gist of how Heisenberg works is when he slashes like that, it means he's going to do a stab. If he uses his right hand, he's going to do a horizontal attack. So you never want to run towards Heisenberg whenever he uses his right hand. Only go towards him when he uses his left hand, like he's doing right now. And typically, he tries to uh, do this little uh, move where he uses his drills in order to uh, like slice down on you. But he doesn't do it that time, he instead tries to do the charge attack, so I had to use my cannon there. And he's doing this move, which I actually discovered something really cool about that move. So, if you actually let Heisenberg do his thing, and he pulls up all the walls above him, if you hit him with a cannon, you can stop the walls from actually appearing on the battlefield. So, that right there is one of the coolest design choices with this fight. If you're having so much trouble with the walls here whenever you're punishing that move, do not shoot Heisenberg in the head. Instead, just wait for him to finish his whole prepping animation, and the moment you see him pull the walls away from him, shoot him with the cannon, and it will destroy all the walls, and you, there will not be any walls on the battlefield unless he decides to do that move again. So, bearing that in mind, you have found a really good way of actually staying ahead of Heisenberg, and just keeping your distance and shooting him, and these walls will not obstruct your shots whatsoever if they're not on the battlefield, if you follow my advice there. And like I said, I don't demonstrate it here because I figured it out after I did this walkthrough. But the fact that they let you do that is amazing. Like, such hidden designs like that are just what makes Resident Evil what it is. And he's doing it again. So right now, I shouldn't be shooting him in the head. I should instead wait for him to pull the walls closer to himself. And then the moment you see the walls go away from him, that's when you shoot him with the cannon to stop the walls from appearing on the battlefield. And business as usual, just shoot the weak spots and make sure you're continually stunning him. Like, look at the amount of hit stun that he takes as well. Why can't the guns in Resident Evil Village do anything like this? Why would they remove the hit stun on so many of the enemies, yet they don't remove the hit stun whatsoever from Heisenberg? And the health threshold for his weak spots are exactly the same on all difficulties. Why is it that that is the case, yet it's not the ca same case for the other enemies on Resident Evil Village on other difficulties? Like, they, they didn't bother compromising the fundamental designs of Heisenberg's boss fight, yet they would compromise a lot of the fundamental designs with their enemies that actually help balance them out. This right here is designed by old Capcom. The every other part of Resident Evil Village is, is designed by new Capcom, and that's a shame. That is a real shame. But Heisenberg's doing this move right now where he's trying to assemble his arm, and Ether actually found a, a weird glitch that happens on PC, where sometimes when you stop Heisenberg from using his arm, the arm just stays there, but it's a visual glitch. So it's just hovering there, and Heisenberg just has a bigger right arm, but it doesn't apply to the gameplay at all, which is so strange. If there's one thing I want to recommend to anyone who wants to play Resident Evil Village, don't play on PC. The PC version has so many problems, and bugs that aren't really apparent on the console version. And Ether had actually posted his own poor designs of Resident Evil Village video, and he showcased a couple of issues specific to the PC version. Like for instance, with Daniela, for some reason there are moments on the PC where Daniela just completely ignores the cold and she just comes right at you even though you're standing in the middle. She, she never does this on console, she only does this on PC and it might be because of the frame rate differences. It might be because of that or it could be due to other problems like the anti-piracy measure 
that actually uh, was applied to PC, it ruined the frame rate so much on the PC version. So new Capcom had to release an update to disable the anti-piracy measures now that the game is released for a couple of months. And that is what improved the frame rate. And even after finding this little problem, the company that made the anti-piracy measure, uh, Denuvo, they're saying it's not the anti-piracy measure's fault. Yet there are videos posted right now of people posting uh, like side-by-side -side clips of gameplay of Resident Evil Village with the anti-piracy measure and without the anti-piracy measure and the differences couldn't be more noticeable, could they? And I, I actually learned that the Nuvo is an anti-piracy measure applied to a lot of games and because it's implemented directly into the game's code, it interferes with certain functionality on the game's part leading to reduced uh, functionality which was very interesting to find that out and aside from that, there are other issues present on PC which make Resident Evil Village play worse on PC compared to console. So take my advice, do not play Resident Evil Village on PC, it's really bad. But that is the end of Heisenberg's boss fight, and we're now about to move on to the next area. Which is an absolutely dreadful section. We're now playing as Chris Redfield, and this whole section that he does in his side character content is horrible. It is pathetic. This could honestly qualify as being the worst section ever in all of Resident Evil Village. And Moreau is the shittest boss fight ever, but we're not talking about boss fights, we're talking about section designs. This is horrible. This is an, an absolute travesty. This is a poorly put together section. It is not built upon any of the strengths of Resident Evil Village. Not that it had any notable strengths to begin with, but compared to Resident Evil 7's Mia section, this section is nothing like Mia's section from Resident Evil 7. Mia's section from Resident Evil 7 builds upon the strengths of Resident Evil 7. With its atmosphere, with its environments, with its gameplay, with its combat, with its enemy designs. And we get none of that in this section here. This is nothing. And we're playing as Chris Redfield, a guy who has been fighting BUWs since 1996, who has done some of the most impressive feats ever for a Resident Evil character, who fought so well against the Molded from Resident Evil 7, and he plays like his 1996 self from Resident Evil 1, and he played like shit in that game. This right here does not build upon any of the incredible foundations of the Naughty Hero DLC's gameplay, this just takes all of that away, just throws it in the trash, and we are playing as an inferior version of Ethan Winters, which is this version of Chris Redfield. And I hate this section so much that I restarted this section so many times because I just wanted to rush through this stupid section and just get it over with, which is why I'm being very reckless here. I'm just throwing grenades like crazy because I want to get this section done. I don't want to play patiently because I, I, I just get so bored with the sequence that it just makes the section even worse but we've now reached the checkpoint and the enemies have stopped spawning so now we're going to be able to do this sequence it's a very short section if you're just speed running through it and i didn't even care i, I don't care about delivering such an optimized performance for this like going through that whole entire section by just spamming grenades is not recommended in the slightest but of course chris has so much health on village of shadows difficulty that why should you really care like, I'm willing to not care about the no damage requirement for this stupid section. This section that is just so uninspired, uninteresting. It does not have any cool section designs at all. It does not have any interesting combat mechanics. And we're just, we're fighting so many lichens, and we already know how shit the lichens are. And his weaponry, why does he not get a shotgun? The shotgun from Resident Evil 7, when Chris was using it, it was very useful against the Molded. It wasn't as good as the pump action shotgun or the double barrel shotgun from the main game, but it was still really good against the, the normal Molded, and it felt like it had a lot of utility. But this right here, we're dealing with so many lichens, and they don't give you any real crowd control tech aside from the grenades and the flash grenades. And these enemies, if you don't set up on the roof, they swarm you like crazy. And for some reason, Chris Redfield is weaker than Ethan Winters. How does that make any sense? And when I say he's weaker, he can't push enemies away! You try to do the push against an enemy, and they just get, like, a little flinch to the head. That's it. That's just a little nudge. That's all it is. He can't push enemies away, he can't even punch them! I mean, he can only punch them if they actually bite him, and then he punches them away. Or if you do the counter, but the counter has no utility here, and why the heck would you want to waste time doing that, where you just get grabbed by an enemy just to see him punch an enemy? And he's so weak as well, he, he takes like six hits! 
six punches to actually get rid of a normal lichen, and each time you're incurring damage. There's no kind of punishing flinch animations with an animation. There's no creative way to actually shoot enemies in the leg and they fall over. There's no real way to be very strategic with your shots to the limbs. There's just no interesting melee system involved. This is such a short section. They could have done so much more with this. It only lasts for a couple of minutes. Would it really be that much of a crime to actually make Chris Redfield feel very different to Ethan Winters? Apparently it is because new Capcom listened to their fans way too much. Like, they weren't afraid at all. Like, old Capcom wasn't afraid to make Chris Redfield feel so different to Ethan Winters in Resident Evil 7. And the scenarios that they put you in were incredibly diverse. They introduced brand new enemies. And the only new enemy we encounter is Urius Strawhair. And Urius Strawhair is just a rehash of uh, Urius, but he's a little bit better than Urius. And this right here, you're going to be seeing one of the stupidest strategies ever for Urius Strawhair. And it really goes to show just how many holes are present with this guy. Because if they're going to be designing this guy for knife only, then they have to make it where he's a freaking idiot, and he does some of the stupidest things ever. So I'm going to do the exact same thing I did against Orius, where I'm just going to stand in front of his left leg and just shoot his leg. And Orius Straw here, he does nothing but long range attacks. He barely has any close range attacks, and he's so tall that his weapon just misses you so much. And when you have this option at your disposal, why would you not want to do this? It is so, so cheesy, the way this is designed. There is just a level of laziness displayed right here. This is not intelligent design right here. This is just a joke. This is laughable. This is just... They stopped caring at this point. And we're just having to use the target locator here. I mean, this could have been a really fun fight. I mean, it is more so than Urias. I mean, doing it normally, it's fine, but this is just the, the normal way you want to do it. And it's very, very efficient. I mean, it's cool that you can crouch under his attacks, and the hitbox on his mace is a little bit better than Urius's hammer. But at least make it look less stupid than this. And this is what they want you to do. They glamorize this because of the fact that they put that Knives Out challenge in for this game. Because of the fact that they put in the Knives Out challenge, they want you to find this hole, and they want you to exploit it. And it just compounds into a very simple fight, which I'm glad it's simple because this room is shit. This room that you're fighting Orius Straw here in is horrible. It is so small, and they're gonna put in a big enemy like this. And he does nothing but long range attacks. Just imagine if Orius Straw here did some of the things that Orius did in his boss fight against Ethan Winters. That right there would honestly be the end of Chris Redfield if Orius Straw here ever did anything like that, but he's too dumb to actually do anything like that. And just. Looking past the Urius Strawyer, th this whole entire section is just awful. This whole entire section is an insult to Chris Redfield. This is the worst version of Chris Redfield by far, when he's just incapable of doing anything creative against the enemies. And not just with his, with his combat, also with his dialogue. His dialogue is so vague, he doesn't try to be like how he was in Resident Evil 6, where he doesn't, bu he, he doesn't hesitate with trying to spill the beans on anything. Like, remember how insistent that Chris was when he wanted to tell uh, Jake about his father? and that he actually killed Albert Wesker. Why was Chris so hesitant to tell Ethan about Miranda? Oh, because he didn't want Ethan to be involved. But simply killing, like, Mia right in front of, uh, Ethan, or at least false Mia, like, simply killing false Mia right in front of Ethan is more than enough to allow Ethan Winters to at least have some motivation to actually get involved in what's happening. And then for some reason, he brings Ethan to Site C, which for some reason, Site C is so close to the village area. So either way, Ethan was gonna get involved. And then he completely underestimates Ethan when he's making some of the stupidest quotes ever, saying that e Leave it alone, Ethan, you're out of your depth, yet you've already killed like two lords at that point. And you want to compound that all together into a very shit combat section that doesn't have any of the interesting mechanics from the Not A Hero DLC. So it just shows that apparently Chris Redfield, rather than evolving, he's just de-evolving as the games progress. It's just, I I've never been so insulted by a game when it comes to its portrayal of, of Chris Redfield. Like, I hate Resident Evil 1 Remake version of Chris, but this is probably the worst version of Chris Redfield by far. This is not the proper evolution of a character. This is not built upon any of the core foundations to Chris Redfield's personality. Like, I think they only made Chris Redfield shit to make Ethan Winters look amazing. And Ethan Winters is so much better than Chris Redfield in this game. Ethan Winters at least undergoes some development. But Chris Redfield doesn't. His development is so poor in this game, and his storytelling is horrendous. His storytelling is not done very well. The dialogue is very poor with Chris Redfield. 
Um, just the, the the way they just try to make Chris Redfield seem like a dark character. He's not a dark character at all. He he looks so much like Carlos. He acts like Carlos so much, and he just he, none of it feels like Chris Redfield. This is not Chris Redfield we're dealing with at all. This is a false Chris Redfield. I, I I'm honestly insulted that they think that a darker version of Chris Redfield is no Chris Redfield at all. I just I I can't believe they would do this. You can tell this game was rushed if they make an iconic Resident Evil character the worst character ever in all of Resident Evil Village. Like, Mia is a better character than Chris Redfield in this, and she only appears in a flashback and at the end of the game. It's just, I'm, I'm mind blown. I'm absolutely mind blown that they did this to Chris Redfield. Uh, I'm just going to stop right there. There's so much more I'm going to say about Chris Redfield in my review, and so many people have hated Chris Redfield in this game, and I 100% agree with them. But we're now dealing with Miranda, and Miranda is very simple, and you need to have the fully upgraded sniper rifle and the grenade launcher if you want to deal with her. So, in the first phase, just avoid her attacks. This one right here, just get around her, and then just uh, sh start shooting her. If she decides to uh, pull her arms out to the side, you got to crouch under the first hit and then get around her. And that's all very simple. Like, I can't even explain these moves fast enough because, you know, the, the upgraded sniper rifle just does so much damage to her. And this right here, strafe left, and then go this way. And then you'll want to keep shooting Miranda. If she jumps, you'll want to uh, avoid the jump attack. And then if she jumps towards you, you'll want to strafe away from her. And make sure you're staying close to her so that she doesn't do the attack where she jumps towards you and then jumps again. And she's now in her flying phase. In the flying phase, I'm going to be able to stop her before she even does an attack. <laughs> Look at that. Look how fast she went down. That is how powerful this sniper rifle is. And it needs to be powerful because there are certain elements of this fight. Like right here, if you don't have a high enough power level, you will never be able to do this part. Because this part is heavily dependent upon arbitrary damage values. Which goes to show the stupidity of new Capcom. When they want to use arbitrary damage values to dictate the stun effectiveness. Or at least the ability to skip phases. And we now have this, so just keep shooting her here. I, I'm not even sure if she's taking damage. I think she takes reduced damage here. I mean, Ether has said she takes damage, but it just doesn't feel like it. I, I, I can see blood coming out of her, so maybe it is doing damage to her. But you can use a flash grenade to skip this phase. Not that it really serves any benefit, because this is a far more advantageous position than just canceling her out of this phase. Because I'm at least doing damage to her for a long duration, and, she, and she's only doing one move. But she does this, and she's going to teleport away, so just hide behind the Mega My seat. And just wait for her to finish her projectile. If you have explosives, apparently you can damage her when she's doing this. It doesn't look like it, though, so I don't trust it. And she's now going to go into the phase where she transitions between each of the individual phases. And the phase transition animations you got to worry about the most are when she transitions from the flying phase into the first phase, or from the flying phase into the spider phase. Because those are the ones that have ridiculous tracking, and they're so hard to avoid. I mean, the flying to spider phase form is a little bit easier, but the flying to first phase form is bullshit. Because she tracks you so much, and if you're close to her, you have no chance of getting away. And even when you're far enough away from her, there are times where she just tries to teleport right next to you. And she gets such a momentum that you just can't avoid it. And she gets so much range on her attacks, and it just feels like she gets lingering hitboxes on those attacks. And also right here, if she decides to go from the spider phase into the flying phase form, you need to make sure you stay under her, because if you don't stay under her, she would go into this whole state of trying to roost right on top of you, meaning, meaning that she'll uh, try to stay right on top of you while those orbs are active, and it makes it almost impossible to avoid the orbs or even shoot them, so you just get free damage in the process, which is bullshit. And right now she's doing the phase transition animation. And I'm going to be able to end this. And that, that's the end of the boss fight right there. And now we just got to do the cinematic phase, which I'm almost certain you have unlimited health during this moment. So you're in no danger here, but it's timed. It's not dependent upon arbitrary damage value. So time your shots exactly when I press the R2 button. And you got to use your sniper rifle for this part. The moment she says feed, shoot her. And then we get into this part right here. So wait for her to uh, finish laughing and then shoot her. And then swap to your grenade launcher right around here is when you shoot her. And then for this part, wait until she finishes lunging forward, and then shoot her. And that's the end of this entire game. That's the end of this walkthrough. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.